I think if you keep up at all with what's going on in communications, and particularly in journalism, I think you have seen some of the problems that journalists, mass communications people generally have to deal with day after day. Uh, the newspaper columnist, for example, who takes material from somebody else's column because it looks so good, puts it into his own column and gives no attribution to the original source. There's the magazine writer. Have any of you seen Shattered Glass? Seen Shattered Glass. Shattered Glass is the story of Stephen Glass. Stephen Glass. He was not not the New York. I'm thinking of the New York Times guy. But the, this was the uh, Washington D.C. <laughs> yeah, he he worked for the New Republic. New Republic. Yes. Yeah, and simply made up stories. He made up sources. He made up quotes that he put in their mouths. And he made up situations in which they were involved. He'd be a wonderful novelist, but he was passing this stuff off as truth and not fiction. Uh, the movie, by the way, is really very good. And uh, I think you might have rent it up there at Blockbuster. Um, Shattered Glass is the name. Or you read the story of the sports reporter who gets on to the notion that a prominent athlete has AIDS and puts, goes to the athlete and checks with the athlete and the athlete says yes, but you know, what's the point? Please don't print that. And the next week he opens USA Today and there's the story <coughs> of his fight with AIDS. He got a blood transfusion, he still had AIDS. A reporter promises a source, I won't tell your name. The source calls up and says, look, I've got some wonderful news here. I've got some stuff that I've just got to get off my chest. It's really got legs, as they say in Washington. But you've got to promise me that you're not going to use my name. And the guy says, okay, I promise. And the next thing you know, the prosecutor is knocking on the door, saying, give me the name, or you go to jail. What is the person, what is the person to do in that situation? Or a television reporter is covering City Hall, and she meets a politician. And they kind of make sparks go between the two of them as she's interviewing them. And the first thing you know, they are dating. And she's still covering City Hall. And she's still covering him. And perhaps they even get married. Uh, what, what happens then? Well, all those are examples of the kinds of ethical problems. I think the major sorts of ethical problems that journalists face, and, and I think uh, communicators uh, generally face in their day-to-day -day work. Questions about truth, questions about privacy of individuals, questions about confidentiality, maintaining confidentiality of their sources, and conflicts of interest. The question is, how do we determine what we ought to do when we come up against those kinds of ethical problems? What are our considerations uh, going to be? Well, first of all, in talking about ethics, what are we talking about? Values? What's ethics? Yes, please. Cambridge. What? Morals. Morals? What does that mean? All right, what's right, what you believe in, but ethics is something a little extra special. What is it? It's a little group believes in more than that. Truth. Truth. What is truth? <laughs> Uh, 
a system that determines between right and wrong? Right and wrong in respect to what? People dealing with each other? People dealing with each other, how we get along. How ought I to be to you? Or you? What should our relationship be? So we're always looking for what ought to be between individuals, between individuals and the broader society when we're talking about uh, something like professional. We're talking about something like professional ethics. And what in this relationship between people are we really after? What are we really, well, let me put it this way, how do you want to be treated? Alex, tell me, how do you want to be treated? Pretty well. Okay, good. Well, we'll, we'll treat you well tonight. I won't pick on him. Since I, he's the only one I know his name, I can pick on him. Um, I want to be treated as, in, as a professional, as... As? As a person? Right. What kind of a person are you? That's a, good or bad, what kind of a person are you? Um, a human being. No, it's human. What is, what is a human being? And? What you, in that higher thought, what do you do when you're thinking? Um, make decisions. Decisions. What is making decisions? The mark of the autonomous individual. I can make decisions. Decisions. Ah, but if you're going to make the right decisions, what do you expect from me? That you'll do the same. <coughs> what? That you'll do the same. That I will do the same. What? Respect. I'll respect you. What does respect in this in this instance for you? <coughs> Well, I mean, appreciating and making decisions that go are, uh, that don't affect negatively whatever that person's decision is. And other and positively. I guess it would have been realizing the value of someone else's own standards and beliefs and all that business. Sure. You want me to treat you as an end, right? You ever had a roommate comes back to the dormitory and says, oh, gosh, that guy just wants to use me. He's just using me. She's using me. What do you want? What do you want from that guy? You don't want him to use you, do you? No. What do you want? Respect. Respect. You are an end. You aren't a means. You want him to promote you. When you find the guy that's going to do that, that's the one you're going to marry, right? Well, in most of our dealings with each other, on the personal level and on the professional level, that's what we want. We want to be treated as ends rather than means, and it's up to the professional, whether it is the doctor. You ever go to one of these guys and go to a doctor? Maybe some of you have fathers or mothers who are doctors. I go sometimes and say, damn quack. Damn quack, all he wants is my money. I didn't fix my problem. No, I'm not an end to his wealth, a means to his wealth. I am an end and I want to be treated as an end. And I expect when I go to a doctor that I am going to be treated as an end. And I expect when I pick up my morning newspaper or turn on my TV set, I'm going to be treated as an end by the reporters, by the people who are doing the advertising, by the public relations people who do the feeding to journalists, and the problems in ethics come in when they treat us as means rather than ends. We, 
in taking on or in, in, in taking on the job of a journalist or an advertising person or a public relations person, what we want to do is to show concern for other people, respect for other people, and we want to try as best we possibly can to avoid harm in conflicting situations. Because the journalist has to write bad things about people. We write about is what's not normal. A story in Sunday's paper, maybe some of you saw it, about Kimberly Williamson Butler, this election clerk of court who was responsible for the elections. And according to the paper, she really goofed. Election machines didn't get to the polling places on time. All kinds of people were unable to vote. You have to write about that. She's a public official. At the same time, you want to try to minimize the harm. You know that harm is going to come to the person. Well, how can we, how can we do that? Well, we've got various kinds of obligations. The same kind as journalists or as communications people. The same kinds of obligations that anybody in society has. What we call general obligations to one another. And then we have particularistic obligations which flow from our being journalists that are particular to our particular profession. And I would say that if we meet those, if we are competent in our field, journalist or competent doctor or competent <coughs> record producer, we will be a virtuous journalist or doctor or record producer. Because we will be doing what we ought to do. What are our major concerns in communication? Truth? Privacy? confidentiality, and conflict of interest, as I said. Those, I think, are the major ones. There are others. But we have only about an hour here. If we had a full semester, but we could go into all of them. Why truth? Why do we want truth? Why do you want that? Why do you want Dan Rather to look out at you every night from his perch in New York and tell you the truth? So, so you have the correct information. So you know, yeah. you think that's not true. Why? Why do you want the correct information? I don't know why would you want the wrong information. Well, I'm not, no, that's not the question. The question is why, <laughs> why do you want the right information? That way you can feel safe making decisions and judgments about things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you can confident. You can, you are an autonomous human being. And it doesn't make any difference whether he's telling you that guy on TV or the person who's written the newspaper story or the person who's written the magazine story. It doesn't make any difference whether he's giving you information about voting that's going to help you. And after all, that's what journalism is. It's useful material, useful information. He's telling you about information that you're going to use when you make up your mind about whom to vote for in the upcoming election. Or the advertiser, you know, if you're going out to buy a pair of shoes, you want the straight talk about those shoes or whether to carry your umbrella. Bob Breck last night told me I wouldn't need my umbrella until this afternoon. Streetcar downtown today. I had to come back, and it rained in the morning. I made the wrong decision because Bob Breck was not honest with me. <laughs> <laughs> I got wet too. I didn't melt though. Do you think it's ethical for um, <clears throat> newspapers or any kind of media form to have a a slant, a political slant, like um, I guess like the New York Times does, and pretty much Fox, yeah. you know Fox. 
a lot of uh, major media. Well, Fox is fair and balanced. <laughs> <laughs> they tell you so. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. Moses makes decisions when they're truthful. They're showing respect for us as persons, right? Also, what about you and this guy's friends? You're not. <laughs> <laughs> In order to become friends, what would what would you say that what role what role does trust play? in this relationship. Yeah, I think you have to have share experiences where you can trust them in that. All right. All right. Is trust necessary to a friendship? You've got to have trust. You have to trust other people. Why? Why? Because when that person trusts you, tells you the truth, he's demonstrating what? He respects you. Sure. Truth demonstrates a respect for persons. And we see this respect for persons everywhere. What was the first thing? You learn that very, very, very early the whole Judeo Christian ethic is built upon that notion. And then finally, finally, what's the rap on President Bush? about the Iran situation, whether you're Republican or Democrat. What is it that the critics are saying? Where did Bush fall down, say the critics? That he's going to get us all blown up, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was Saddam Hussein doing? He's creating weapons. He had weapons of mass destruction. We on that basis, did what? To war. And then as it turns out, there weren't any of those weapons of mass destruction. The weapons of mass imagination. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Public opinion was formed on the basis of an untruth, apparently, say the critics. Bush says, well, it doesn't make any difference. Saddam Hussein is gone. Well, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. The whole democratic process relies upon public officials telling us the truth. That's why we get so upset. That's why Richard Nixon left office. Why did he leave office? Because the burglars broke into the Watergate apartment? He lied, lied about it. What was Bill Clinton so in such difficulty about? The women? He lied about it. What did you, what did you learn from this high? Mother and father were saying, I don't care what you do, just tell me the truth. Just tell me the truth. And then you find out. You'll find out some of the kids all, all of them, you'll all lie to your parents. <laughs> and you'll find out then that they lie to you. They're terribly hurt. It takes a great leap to remember back. And you stood there and looked straight in your mother's eye or your father's eye and said, No, I didn't go there. I didn't do that. I didn't go out uh, go out. But we need that in personal relationships we needed in the democratic process as well. It's crucial. And that's where journalism, the importance, I think really the, the serious importance of journalism, uh, truth in journalism lies in its importance in the democratic process. It's essential. The democracy depends upon informed people. Thomas Jefferson said one time, <clears throat> if I could choose 
whether to have government without newspapers or newspapers without a government. I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Information is what's crucial. The government is, is less important. Journalistic truth is, first of all, accurate. We're talking about truth. We want accuracy. Joseph Pulitzer, the great 19th century publisher, he also brought us, helped to bring us yellow journalism. But he had in his newsroom signs on all the walls in the newsroom. Accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. Adlai Stevenson said one time, accuracy is to a newspaper as virtue is to a woman. Journalistic truth also helps to promote, or should help to promote, our understanding of the world and what's going on. And journalists are criticizing themselves pretty heavily these days for really not giving us a great deal of understanding about what we have been through, what we're going through. And I think they're going to have, you know, we, count, we go through these, these periods frequently. But uh, we're worried about this promoting balance. It demands that journalists themselves understand the story, rather than just standing out there and having somebody lick your ice cream cone. <laughs> and pass it on to the next person to lick the ice cream cone. And then, what was your question about? Um, the two words kind of that, vague. that Geraldo invented? Um, political slant. Fair and fair and balanced. Fox News, fair and balanced. What does fair and balanced mean? Just fairness. What is fairness? Impartiality. Impartiality? What do we you use the term, I think when you were talking about the New York Times? Um, forgot exactly what I said. What? Slant bias? Bias, yeah, bias. We're concerned about bias. Well, frequently, what we have found is that bias is in the eye of the beholder, many times. Although, I, I, I would say maybe in much of the time it is. I've got a, a colleague whose wife was a delegate to the Republican National Convention. He came back and he was just stomping the halls of the communications area. New York Times. Oh, you should have seen it when we were there. Oh, his headlines. Practically a very mild mannered guy. He was practically foaming at the mouth. The New York Times being biased against the Republicans. I didn't notice that. I read the same paper. Of course, I wasn't in New York at the time, but it didn't seem that way to me. But there are people out there who are always looking to see is it is it tilting one way or the other. Journalists really do try to balance what they're doing, to not be biased, inclining to one side or the other, particularly in a period now where we don't have as many news organizations as we, as we once had. It's also a, the idea of recognizing views that promote understanding. Now, I would like to watch the news hour with Jim Lehrer at 7 o'clock at night at NPR. Now, it's not one of the most exciting television programs. Maybe why I fall asleep after dinner so often. But what do they do? You, you obviously, you watch it? I had to You're watch You're from it. Milwaukee, you watch it on WUW? What is that, WUW? No. Channel 12 in Milwaukee? Yeah, ABC. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had, for high school government class, we had... Where'd you go to high school? Whitefish Bay. Okay. Um, and what? I just wanted to know. Oh. Uh, and we had to watch um, an, minds. an episode of it. Of what? The News, news Hour. hour was and what did they do with the News Hour? Anybody else ever watch it? It's been a while. Like the News Hour, you will love C-SPAN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's not just Jim Lear. I think he has other people on the show. Sure. And they have a discussion. Yeah, and what do they do? What about the guests? What, what kind of guests do they do? 
Do you remember? Aren't they reporters usually? Or well, different journalists? Or? Sometimes, but also... Congress people. What? Congress people. Sometimes they get congressmen. Celebrities. What? Celebrities. No. Well, rarely celebrities. They tend to get they tend to get people who are experts. Although they try to get them from a range of areas so that you will get people who disagree with one another. And they will ask questions to kind of pull out the disagreement, looking for the points the common points and then also for the points of disagreement. And, and it's really very, very well done. On the other hand, has anybody ever watched the McLaughlin Report? John McLaughlin? They're all shouting and screaming at each other, right? And, and half the time you can't even understand what it, is they're, what it is they're saying. Well, I think that's the difference. What, what journalists attempt to do is to provide this, this balance, the, the uh, going for the views that help to promote understanding. Adverti what about truth in advertising and public relations? They aren't held to quite the same standard. We know that they, advertisers and public relations people, are advocates. We know that they're going to slant the truth in their direction. But still, we want them to be honest with us. <coughs> we, don't, we, we recognize that they're going to tell us all the good points of that you know, 2005 lemon that's going to be coming off the, the assembly line in Detroit and going onto our TV screens in the fall. But we accept that. We know that car isn't that good. But we grant them a little leeway along the way, as long as they don't just flat out, flat out lie to us. They still have, they still have that obligation. What about privacy? What does privacy mean? Privacy. When you think about yourself as are you a private person? Are there things you don't want people to know about you? Tell me why. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just <laughs> That's violating my privacy. <laughs> yeah. Why? What is it? What is it? Somebody's after you to get down your deep, dark secrets. Somebody is stalking you. Somebody is taking your picture all the time. Somebody's listening to your telephone call. Somebody's going to the library to check up and find out what terrible books you've been reading. Somebody goes onto the internet and gets all the places, all those websites that you've been going to. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just got one of those secrets. <laughs> what do we call it? What, what do you say to those people? What would you say to somebody like that who's doing all that stuff? Yeah, they're well, what would you say to them? Stop. Leave me alone, right? Privacy, the basic definition would be the right to be let alone. And one of the great problems is with journalism frequently is that we do not honor that right uh, to be let alone. Why privacy? Why privacy? Why do you want to safeguard your privacy? You don't care. No, it's your... So you can choose what's public and what's not public. You can choose. You can choose. You make a choice. You are what kind of an individual? Autonomous. An autonomous individual. You want to be an autonomous individual. If people start snooping. They start going through your garbage. They're finding out what you're eating, what you're reading, what you're thinking. You have lost a degree of autonomy. You want to have control. A lot of, we see a lot of movies about that where people sort of lose control because people find out so much about them. You want to be protected. Alex, sitting here in the library over in the corner of that computer room, tapping away on that computer with a big smile on his face. He doesn't want you to know about all those sites he's going to. Why? 
because that would open him up to scorn and ridicule. <laughs> would <it> not? <laughs> Alex wants his privacy so that he can control his reputation. reputation. What is more valuable to you than your reputation? How you are viewed out there among everyone else in the world. And this is one of the concerns that we have as individuals, and the concern that we have as journalists. We want to keep others at a distance, our personal space. Leave me alone. Get away from me. Give me some space. And that's not just physical, but it's intellectual as well. And privacy is also, or should be, a shield against government intrusion. One of the great debates, one of the many debates in this presidential election is over how far should we go, if at all, in amending the Patriot Act. So people can't just walk into a doctor's office and demand to see your records or walk into the library and want to know what books you've been taking on. That's a zone. They're invading on privacy. And we're, we are concerned about that. What kinds? Yes, sir. It's uh, personal respect that the general public should have for you. Yes. Yeah. General, a, a personal respect. That's what we want. We want that respect as persons again. It all boils down. It all boils down to that, exactly. And where could the journalist go wrong in, 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 in intruding on someone's privacy? Ask Arthur Ashe. Remember Arthur Ashe, great tennis player? <coughs> was ill, had a blood transfusion, contracted the AIDS virus in his blood transfusion, had a wonderful reputation, trying to protect his privacy, largely for the sake of his family. And then the reporter, the sports reporter for USA Today found out and splashed it across the pages of USA Today. Anybody with a contagious disease <coughs> is concerned about protecting privacy. President Ford, some years ago, was going through a line shaking hands with people, and the young woman pulled out a pistol and fired him. And there was a guy standing next to her who grabbed the pistol and saved Ford's life. Well, in trying to find out who this guy was, reporters found out that he was homosexual. And they said, well, oh, that's in the stories. That had nothing to do with the story. Ought they have done that? Doesn't that, that he had to surrender? He lost a great deal of control over himself when that occurred. People who are, who are accused of sex crimes. Kobe Bryant. The victims of of uh, alleged rapists protect their privacy, and there's a great question: If you let Kobe Bryant's name out, why not let out the name of his accuser? Shouldn't that be public as well? Uh, and journalists have to balance that, have to deal with that kind of thing. What about using children as sources? Uh, what about uh, using secret cameras to find out what people are doing? Or tape recorders? Well, police investigators can use them, but should journalists? Is that not an invasion of privacy when we use those? And what about people with accidents, personal tragedies? Worst things journalists will tell you, many journalists will, some of them doesn't matter at all. Worst thing you have to do is to go out to the home of somebody who's had a loved one killed and knock on the door and ask for information. 
how far should you go? And when you are talking to the mother who has just lost a 19-year-old son who's been killed in a car bombing in Beirut, and she starts to cry, and you've got this camera there, do you just hold that camera on her face while she falls apart? Then, just hold it on her. But then when you get to the editing suite, to specifically leave in all that footage, we're concerned about how we do Is that not an invasion of the person's privacy in some way or other? How do we struggle through that? How do we struggle through that? How do we struggle through those kinds of questions? First one, respect for persons. You look at respect. But also, how do you balance? How do you balance? The public's need to know about some things with individual's privacy. What we talk about is social utility. Do we really need to know that our do we really need to see that mother falling apart in front of her eyes? How do you balance those? Well, how do the, how do the tabloids, how do the supermarket tabloids balance that? <laughs> Is there fairness yeah. and balance there? Yeah. No. But most reputable news organizations do try to balance uh, those two. And we're concerned with Trying to figure out, you know, so many people are concerned <coughs> with, uh, you know, privacy, but they really want to see other hu others' human weaknesses, and like, it just kind of counteracts their like their need for their privacy and respect. It seems to me, at least. I mean, oh, there's a reason those tabloids are so popular. There's a reason Fox News is the highest rated cable network. You know, like well, but I think part of it is there's a streak of the voyeur in all. This. <coughs> you ever been on the freeway when there's been an accident? Slow down. <coughs> Everybody drives past, and then here's one guy, he's driving like this, and the guy in back of him is saying, get moving, and then he gets up there to that point.